Are you able to hear me? Yes. While the rest of them are getting started, I just want to say good afternoon and thank you for your patience. We'll be a little bit shorter than the last panel um, uh, because we are minus uh, one, one speaker today. And uh, I wanted to tell you that I'm absolutely thrilled to have this executive conversation on integrity and transparency, primarily because it's such a critical topic. And we focus so many times on uh, controls or uh, audits, things like that, but not on the, on the human side, the behavior side of things. So it's quite nice to see so many people interested in, uh, in having this conversation around integrity and, and transparency. So with that, we'll get started. And um, the first question I have will be for you, Zolfe. And um, Mumtakala is ranked amongst the most transparent sovereign wealth funds. So the question is, why is this focus on transparency in government so important? And what are the benefits to the businesses? Sure. Why don't I just start with uh, just briefly describing Mumtalakat. Uh, so Mumtalakat is a sovereign wealth fund of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, and it was specifically created in 2006 um, to take ownership of a variety of commercial assets that were held at the government level. And these are commercial uh, businesses that span a wide uh, a variety of different industries. Uh, from aviation, industrial companies, uh, healthcare, consumer. Um, so the idea was to uh, put all of these companies, um, the ownership in a holding company structure that could manage, uh, manage them uh, with, with, uh, with the goal of pushing governance, transparency, and through that to enhance the value of the portfolio over time. So really by, by definition, we were established for that very purpose, to, to push and drive uh, governance and transparency. Um, why is that important? Um, well, really, if you think about it, we're, we are a, um, uh, an investment management company. Right? So we have uh, in our portfolio 40, 40 uh, different companies in which we own uh, varying stakes, some 100% some, uh, owned, others less so. And to manage this portfolio and to drive value successfully, um, what, we, what we do is we utilize governance and transparency uh, to, to push, I guess, what we'd call the three C's. So it's, it's clarity, uh, collaboration, and culture. So clarity, what I mean by that is that because we have so many different stakeholders, so 100% owned by government of Bahrain, um, we have a, a board on our, um, you know, board of Muntalakat, which is represented both by government individuals as well as private sector individuals. Uh, we're a publicly rated entity, so we have uh, sukuk and bondholders. We have uh, creditors uh, that, we, that we have as stakeholders. Um, we have co-investors, co-shareholders in some of these public, uh, uh, portfolio companies. The portfolio companies themselves are key stakeholders, right? So they, they have their own boards, they have their own management teams. All of this system needs to understand with great clarity what are the objectives, what are the strategies, uh, what are the rules of engagement, how are we going to do what it is that we're trying to do, uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So for us, it's the governance and transparency that drives that clarity so that everybody's on the same page, everybody knows, uh, everybody knows what they're supposed to do and, and how they're supposed to do it. Collaboration, um, again, because we're an investment company that has um, you know, a, a global uh, scope, we, we invest not only in the GCC, but in Europe, in the US, um, and again, very diverse uh, companies. We need partners. We, we want to be a good partner, but we also want to attract good partners. And so again, the transparency aspect is critical for us to attract the right partners to co-invest with us to un understand and align our objectives together. So, you know, once you attract a partner, you have to make sure that that there is complete understanding of each other's um, you know objectives, of each other's strengths, weaknesses, so that that collaboration and that partnership can really benefit uh, to enhance value through that collaboration. Um, and the and the final uh, item is is culture, as I mentioned, which you know at the end of the day, it's uh, it's absolutely critical that. You know, we have a culture that is driving uh, forward to push all of these types of initiatives, that everybody's on the same page, 
And, and that in itself, what it does is it, it, it puts in, in place a, a very natural state of accountability because everybody knows what we're supposed to achieve, everybody knows what they're supposed to do, therefore you, you have to be accountable for it. And, and, and so, you know, for us, trans transparency in governance uh, is, is, uh, is fundamental to, to everything that we, that we do. Great, and, and Mr. Khaled? Uh, to pick up on that then, uh, there's many different ways, as we've just heard, to drive uh, compliance and, and why it's so important. So um, what does transparency mean uh, in terms of responsible care within a company, as well as um, is, it, is it transparency that drives it or is it uh, corporate integrity with, which drives it, which is the, the right balance of the two? First of all, I thank you for inviting me, and I need to thank all the panelists who were earlier. I learned a lot from them. And uh, we hear the common theme in all of this discussion is the culture. And we hear also being sustainable. And sustainability is very important for any business entity. And uh, uh, what drives sustainability is employing a lot of proper practices. Uh, and that comes with disclosures, that comes with compliance, that comes with a lot of regulations. But it's easy to write them, it's easy to impose them, but it's very difficult to embrace them. And the key word here for any business or even government sector is to embrace these values, embrace these regulations, and that's not an easy task. In the business sector, we serve stakeholders, a number of stakeholders, our employees, our investors, uh, our society. And uh, unless we all in that business unit believe in these and our values and our responsibilities and our role to our society, unless we believe in it, uh, we will be acting selfish in a number of occasions. We talked about woman empowerment, we talked <coughs> about the society, we talked about maybe we haven't touched the uh, uh, subject related to environment, but in the petrochemical sector, environment is very essential for us. In Kimenol, I need to give you an example of that. <clears throat> Five years ago, we just raised a question to our employees. What is the most important part you're worrying about in running the daily operation. And the response is, was that a disaster that may take a place in handling these dangerous chemicals, if it's not controlled properly, may cause a disaster to our society, to our environment. People get killed easily. So we went and we employed the most sophisticated system that has ever available in the world, in the world of bitter chemicals. And it's basically the system of the responsible care. And responsible care is not an ISO that so many people they employ. Responsible care is way of life. And it is set of rules and systems that govern the complete supply chain from inception, from raw material procurement to processing to delivery and handling. And we, we screened our culture. When I say culture, our employees, their, their values, their, their understanding. And we found that there is a gap between their knowledge of their dues toward the society, toward the employees, toward the stakeholders, and their, and, and their knowledge about the process itself. So we have done a massive restructuring. And we have re-employed a number of people, top of the cream within the petrochemical sector in, in Jubail and Saudi Arabia. And in three years, they have brought a tremendous change because they believe in it. No one has imposed that regulation on us. We believed in it. And in my way back, uh, why may, why, my way here to, to Dubai, I got a phone call that we were awarded the certification of responsible care. Congratulations. So that credit goes to our employee for that. Now, the journey hasn't ended yet. There is another three years program to embrace these values. Again, we have done it because we believe in it. 
We have done it because we need our investors to, to look at us as a potential uh, 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 target to invest in. We are a listed company. Maybe uh, Mr. Zulfi, one of those days, they will invest in, in our stocks. <laughs> Why not? All right. <laughs> we are opening up uh, for the foreign investors. So um, we don't want to put regulations that uh, we don't believe in it. We need to put regulations. We need to believe in it. If there is a difficulty to believe in it, we have to change the culture. And I, uh, uh, I was uh, very touched when I heard uh, Saida Lubna talking about the empowerment of female. I have to admit, the percentage of female in our company is zero. So, uh, but I have to admit, in order to correct the situation. But uh, we know that we have an untapped resources, and having a female at least we start with something, will create a lot of value to us. So to answer the question, a very brief uh, answer is uh, changing rules, compliance, it adds value, it creates sustainability to the organization, it attracts investors, and definitely uh, uh, it improves the overall culture where we are working. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Demir, today you are a resident expert in uh, partnerships and collaborative actions. So we've just heard a success story, but it's not always easy to do this alone. And so if we want to do this together, can you please give us some examples uh, of where progress has been made and maybe some, what are some of the key lessons that were learned in that progress? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to congratulate my good friend, brother, for taking this on as this Pearl Initiative agenda. And of course, Georg, if you look at uh, both of these initiatives, they are voluntary in nature. Uh, there is there's an argument that you put forward legislation and you might change the, uh, the dynamics of it. But actually, as Khaled just mentioned, you really need to change the culture. Uh, the culture can only change when it comes from the top. Sure. It has to come by way of example at the leadership role. CEOs have to say, I want this to happen, and I'll do it not by stealth, but by engaging people. Often people get confused uh, that by just imposing some new values, <coughs> you'll be able to change uh, the image of the company. And sometimes it is about trying to change the image of the company rather than the reality. So it's, it is a, a fair bit of combination of effort. Uh, we heard early on about the role of women in society, women in corporate uh, functions. Um, I think our species need to understand that women do play an important role and they can actually contribute uh, to, to actually doing well and doing good in business. So what's, what's happening out there? I, the UN is now getting ready to adopt the new sustainable development goals. The word sustainability has been in the annals of the UN for decades, uh, going back to the first Rio conference, actually, in, way back in 1992. Uh, UNDP's model was sustainable development, alleviating poverty or poverty agency, but sustainable development. Uh, we used to believe in CSR, the traditional CSR, I'm so pleased to see that we don't really discuss it too much now, although we're still around that terminology. Uh, the change which is coming through is being led by the top. CEOs are now starting to say that if I put out a product with my team, and if it is not successful, I want to take ownership of it, take responsibility, and tell my team, talk to my team about it, put it out there that that product or that service line is not working. For example, the role of women in society, the role of women in the companies. I, increasingly, there is a, a trend to highlight how many senior women are in the organization. Uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, when he came into office, he insisted that he would bring in senior women, and he changed that equation. It's now 50-50. Although just recently two senior women left and 
they've been replaced by men, but actually it's 50-50 senior women. I, so those things are starting to take place. But companies actually need to say, here are the challenges in our core business models and actually put it out there. Show leadership in terms of transparency and make themselves accountable. You cannot make your employees accountable without you being held accountable yourself. Great. Um, I think one of the ribbons that I hear throughout this, so one, of the, one of the themes that I hear is trust. And there seems to be trust uh, amongst uh, the different, the different uh, panels and, and amongst the different topics. But trust seems to be one of the, one of the key elements. And we had that conversation prior to the, to the panel today. Um, so if I can come back then um, to a question for you. Uh, as an investor, how important is it to have uh, these higher degrees of transparency in companies uh, within the region? And um, is this a key factor in terms of getting investors from other regions uh, to, to invest in the, in the region? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're in an environment where, you know, there's a, a set, set of standards that I think is, is becoming quite similar, whether it's a, a company based in the GCC or the region or if it's based outside, whether you have an investor from the region or outside, I think the expectations are very similar in terms of what, uh, what is uh, available in terms of disclosure, in terms of you know, the, 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 uh, the corporate governance at the, at the company. Um, you know, that being said, this region obviously has you know, businesses that are, many more businesses that are perhaps in an earlier stage, or maybe not as many businesses that are in a more mature stage. So, You'll have, you'll have you know, uh, different degrees of, of transparency and governance at these, at these entities, but it's, I think it's important to recognize that, that governance and transparency doesn't just happen, right? So it has, it has to be proactively uh, implemented. There has to be a recognition for the importance. There has to be an acceptance of why that's important. And depending on the stage of a particular company, it may or not may or may not be as important. So when you're just starting out, just getting getting the business up and running might be the most important thing. So I think you know we have to appreciate that. I mean, we at at Mumtalaka, you know, again going back to why we were established, we were fortunate in that that was that was the key purpose of establishing this, right? Is 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 transparency and 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 corporate governance that we need to push at the portfolio companies. Now. Even then, um, there's been plenty of room for improvement. We've, so day one when we were established, uh, actually very shortly after we were established, we were rated by the, um, uh, the uh, there's a Sovereign Wealth Institute, um, the Linodom, uh, Lineberg Model uh, Transparency Index. So we got eight out of 10, with, effectively without even trying. This is just who we are. We had disclosure on all of our portfolio companies on our website. We show our financials. We were publicly rated. But eight out of 10, you know, you're, we were about in the top 10% of all the sovereign wealth funds in the, in the world. And we could have said, that's, that's fine, right? We're happy, eight out of 10 is great. Uh, but again, I think what happens when you, when you adopt these, these types of themes throughout your organization is you have a culture that wants to keep pushing. And so over the last four or five years, we've gone from eight out of 10 to nine out of 10 to 10 out of 10 by proactively going to the people who run this index and saying, what can we do to get better? Mm -hmm. How can we improve ourselves? And so I think, you know, it doesn't matter who you are as, you know, as, a, as a corporate entity, there, there's always room to improve. Uh, more, more, most recently, we've initiated uh, with, uh, with our friends from INSEAD uh, a director's training program that we've mm -hmm. sent our nominee directors of our portfolio companies to train at these, uh, at these modules. And Professor Ludo is here from INSEAD who, who can also talk about it. But that was eye-opening for us as well because one thing we learned, and it was a prevalent theme, was that these individuals who were the directors, they were very eager to learn. So it wasn't that there is not the desire. It's, it's having the format and, and the, the tools available to understand what are my jobs as a, as a director, what, is good corporate governance? What is the right balance of transparency? 
Um, and so I think those are things that, you know, I think we, we have to keep pushing. One of the things we learned as a, as a shareholder in these portfolio companies, interacting with all these directors uh, at, at these uh, training sessions, they still felt that they still didn't have a good understanding of what the shareholder, we the shareholder, wanted and expected of the companies, which is eye-opening. I, I assumed, given our 10 out of 10, these guys know what we <laughs> want, we, you know, it's clear. But I think you know, it's, it's a work in progress, uh, and Professor Ludo says it's, uh, it's, it's a journey, right? Good corporate trend, uh, governance is a journey, and I honestly believe that. No, and I, I definitely would agree that, that that's the hard part. And I think that that's what you said, Khaled, uh, in your last uh, statement, is that, that embedding it, embracing it, was the, was the, the hard part. Sure. Um, and so I'll, I'll turn back to you then with another question. So the requirements are changing on transparency. They're changing globally. They're changing regionally, changing nationally. Um, amongst all of these changes, um, how does this affect the companies who are listed or who are looking to list within the, the stock exchanges? Statistically speaking, those companies who have gone for uh, more disclosures, mm -hmm. more transparent, they sustain more and they attract more investors. Uh, again, statistics says that, talking about the family business, they barely survive to second or third generation. Uh, uh, and we have seen in Saudi uh, stock exchange that around 17 family business been becoming a listed companies. And they have become a listed companies and their performance even improved. Uh, they are uh, very well run professionally. They are segregating ownership from, from management. They are employing the best people. They are attracting more investors. And the perception that regulations or transparency will impair their privacy or confidentiality, that's really improper. Actually, the other way around, they're becoming more competitive. They are, uh, uh, sustain their, their result is improving. Their earning per share is improving. They're getting traded more. Um, and frankly speaking, the name of the company is becoming, it carries a lot of value as well. We have seen a number of family business, been in the business for last 50, 60 years, and becoming a public. And their name becoming having more and more value, not because of their family name, but also because of the level of transparency the level of trans disclosures they have uh, embedded within their system. They believed in it. No one has come and imposed that on them. Of course, the rules of uh, uh, capital market authority is, is being imposed to everybody, but they believe in it. Even when they are running their business among their relatives or among the other fellow board members, they ensure that the compliance has taken place. <clears throat> so actually, and this message for whoever would like to list their companies or even doesn't have it in their plan, more disclosure, more transparency, it adds value. At the end, it adds value. And we should not be short, uh, uh, have a short vision or that only looking to the cost associated with it. No, actually, you have to look to the long-term benefit that comes out of it. And this is being practiced, and the statistics says that. I would just uh, just to add to that. I mean, I, we, you know, we engage with a lot of uh, very successful companies in the region that are that are uh, currently private and that are gearing themselves up to become public companies. And I've been surprised that you know many of these companies are not only you know getting themselves geared up for a local exchange listing, but they want to then actually prepare themselves for a London listing or an international yeah. listing because it does carry more prestige and it, and it demonstrates that they are a company that can manage themselves with that level of transparency, that level of disclosure, having that many international investors focused on them. So uh, I actually see it as, a, as, as something that it's an aspiration that, that the really good companies in this region are, are doing it and are aspiring for, for that. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And, and again, I hear that trust then. This is their first foundation of building that trust to get to your next level. 
Um, so Amir, if I can come back to you, we know that it's not always easy to walk alone and there's safety in numbers and so you have two representatives from different organizations uh, who, who you can now add to your, to your uh, lessons learned and, and best practices list. And so what are some of the steps that within the Gulf region that you can take towards collective action and realistically um, what are some of the targets and, and best practices that you think that the, the businessmen here today will, will benefit from? So I, I actually also want to go back to some of the very good comments, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like what you said about the UN rankings of the Sovereign Wealth Funds Institute, for example. Public sector companies, they get branding or they get recognition because they comply with certain rules and regulations through the capital markets and there's some kind of minimal requirements at least. But family-owned companies and private companies don't have anything. Uh, the Global Compact has been successful because it has been careful in how it keeps its companies. It has a requirement for reporting. So it's become a branded thing that if you're a member of the Global Compact, you have credibility because you're complying with the 10 principles. <clears throat> I think there is merit in looking, and we talked about that in the uh, governance board with uh, our chairman, Hamid Jaffer, and Badr and I, we, a number of us discussed the idea of kind of a pearl ranking of some sort where we give recognition to the family-owned businesses within certain parameters where in terms of compliance with certain kind of guiding principles, if you like. And we say compliance in a very light heart, light, a lighter way, not regulatory. It's also clear that uh, without best practice and lessons learned, you can get nowhere. Uh, I, I, the work you're doing, path-breaking work at the World Economic Forum, for example, is about sharing from each other, learning from each other. And people will say, well, it works in the mining industry, but it doesn't work in uh, the food and beverage industry. Uh, the transparency levels are different uh, and often public companies tend to be a little cautious about what they will publicly announce because they live by what Wall Street expects them to do the next morning, how they perform. But the SMEs don't have that uh, requirement. So SMEs can be a little bit more enterprising, uh, so to say. What we need to do is to provide them some guidance, provide them some guiding principles as to how they report, how can they act on. At this point in time, uh, the, the way we've been in the Pearl Initiative, we've been importing knowledge is the way uh, Imelda has held a number of workshops around the region, helping people share their examples, but also give them some ideas on how to report. And on that, on that note of multi-stakeholder, then I'm, I'm going to throw a question to the whole panel. So uh, I do come from the World Economic Forum where we do a multi-stakeholder uh, platform, a forum actually, uh, and we bring in civil society, we bring in government, we bring in industry at the highest levels to make sure that when we're looking at solutions, that we're looking at solutions that fit all, all companies. Um, many uh, members are sitting in our room today of, uh, of the World Economic Forum. And so um, that will be my question to the panel is, what are the priorities uh, when you look at this multi-stakeholder uh, interaction? Um, who's responsible for what? Does everyone have a stake? Is, is, is one group more responsible than the other? I think uh, it is equally important that uh, for a business sector mm -hmm. to initiate the dialogue initiate the exchange of information. Um, we do a lot of communication between ourselves in Kimono and, and our stakeholders in a number of forums, a number of ways. And uh, we ensure that we disclose not only the minimum, we disclose even more than that. And uh, we present our strategy to all of our stakeholders. Um, up to the level that we are allowed to as a publicly listed company. We in, uh, attend all of those uh, uh, seminars or conferences where there are strategic partners are available. 
we approach uh, officials, we, do, we, we present them our strategy, our frustration, our aspiration, our plans. We try to bridge the gaps. Uh, we talk on our behalf and the behalf of the sector. Uh, 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 we strongly believe that the business sector has to drive those changes, and they have to believe in it. And we should not always wait for the government sector or society uh, uh, or civil sectors mm -hmm. to come. I think we have to be proactive, act quickly, perceive the future, and plan accordingly. And we do that on a regular, on a regular basis. <coughs> and we're not doing it enough, but uh, that has to continue. And we should address all of those matters that are really important to our stakeholders, whether it was an employment, it was uh, uh, um, education, uh, uh, investments. And if we do our job properly, I think there will be a lot of opportunities that will be available for us. And there will be a lot of uh, value which we will be adding to our society. More communication, more coordination, more planning, proper planning will bridge always the gaps. So partnerships is purely about relationships. Uh, and multi-stakeholder partnerships is about multiple relationships. Uh, and I totally agree with you that you have to think about the stakeholders. Uh, we like to think that it also goes to the communities at large. So it's in the entire supply chain, you have your consumer or a customer at the end of the day, but it actually goes beyond the customer into the sure. entire community. And if we start thinking that uh, what's in it for me for the other side, not for myself, for the other partner, then you start to answer the question and engage people in ways that you've not been able to do. I, our experience has been that uh, understanding if you like, corporate uh, personalities, whether it's the UN, whether it's uh, NGOs, whether it's academia, private sector, often that corporate culture is miles apart. So we have to come together. Definitely. Any, any, yeah, any I mean, thoughts? I think from you know, one angle that I would, would talk about is that you know, given our institution, we we appreciate very much that there are clear lines that have been drawn in terms of what Muntalakad is expected to do versus our shareholder, the government, is, is trying to do, right? So what works is that, you know, given that we own commercial assets, uh, commercial businesses, is that the government does not impose non-commercial objectives. So as the sovereign wealth fund of Bahrain, um, I have a mandate uh, to improve the value of these companies, to invest in sustainable businesses that will bring good returns on our investment. Um, there is no mandate to create jobs in Bahrain. There's no mandate to bring industries into Bahrain. This, this becomes a result of doing the first part of it right, right. So I think the biggest issue that you can have in a lot of these state-owned companies that have a mix of commercial and government is that you haven't drawn the lines appropriately and, and the objectives aren't set out very clearly because then the worst case scenario could be that you are creating unsustainable businesses, short-term jobs that create you know, big budget deficits and ultimately lead to loss of jobs. So I think that's I think very good lesson that we've learned uh, from, from our side. Great. So I think at this point, if we can ask the audience to pick up the, the, pa the, the button pad, we have two statements for you to vote on today. The first statement is shareholders and investors in the region are currently getting all of the information that they need on companies in order to make effective decisions. Do you strongly agree, partially agree, neutral on the matter, or you disagree? And you, have that. Oh. you have buttons as well if you're yes. so inclined. Don, Don yes. <laughs> OK. Thank you. 
Okay, uh -oh. so we, we don't have everything we need, apparently, to make the decisions that, that we are, um, that we're in need of. Um, I, I think this is probably accurate not only in this region, but in, in many other parts of the world where we have a problem looking at due diligence versus uh, uh, privacy laws, and, and that makes life challenging. Uh, amongst other things. Can, and can I comment? Sure, sure. I great. totally agree with that. Though I, I voted neutral, but I think the, we have to do more <laughs> on the disclosure part of it. Mm. And that will come. That will come. And I'm giving you as an example only in Saudi Arabia where we are opening for foreign investors. Foreign investors will come, as uh, 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 Zolfi has indicated, when you are transparent, you are disclosing. So we need to do more than that. And we have to work more also in the board of directors selection and their understanding of their role and responsibility for their, of their, of their role. And I want to throw a question out as long as, as, long as I can do that. Um, so you mentioned uh, that, that, we're not, that we don't have all of the information that we need. Um, do you think it's up to companies to, uh, to start disclosing more and, and to be the first one to take that step? Or uh, you, you want to wait and be regulated? Of that question to me, sure. I, I would say that the current regulation, let's take the lessons that we learned from our journey in Saudi Arabia. The Capital Market Authority has started in 2003, mm -hmm. and officially they start putting rules and regulation in 2004, and now we're talking about 10 years of journey. We have improved a lot. Now, I'm not saying that we need to wait another 10 years to reach to, to change this uh, result. What I'm saying is that there are a lot of efforts that's taken place where the investors themselves, they will believe. And this is very important. Mm -hmm. I'm not pro putting more of regulations, maybe guidelines, yes. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the private sector need to believe in it. And we are starting to feel the importance of disclosing information, major events, coordination, mm -hmm. uh, plans for future. You know, very, I don't see, I have seen only one company that putting uh, a plans for a future. So far, it's not mandatory to do it. I don't know whether it will ever become a mandatory, but it's very important for us to be attractive to the potential investors to disclose a relevant information uh, for strategic and long-term investors. Great. Are there any follow-up? I, I just want to echo what uh, Khalid was just saying. That that's the ethos of the Pearl Initiative. The idea is very simple. Uh, how can we create a culture of transparency and accountability which is led by the private sector? And, you know, and not be subject to regulation. And, and it's a business model of doing well and doing good. If you're more transparent, you'll attract more capital. So you're doing well, and out of that process, and that's how we uh, talked about this, brother and I talked about it, I mean, Jaffer had said, look, I need to be thinking of trust. That's, that's the basic principle. The foundation, yeah, yeah yes. definitely. So we have a second statement for you, if we can, if we can have the statement on the, on the screen. All companies in the Gulf region, whether publicly or privately held, should be uh, obliged to implement good governance and accountability practices and report them publicly. <laughs> okay, so, so we strongly agree then. That, that's, um, that's interesting because right. the, the, the key word for me here is, is obliged, yeah. and that was part of the reason I asked the question of, uh, <laughs> of uh, do you want to be regulated or, or do it yourself? So that's an interesting outcome. But I think it's quite positive that 67% of people believe that, uh, that yes, that, that this is important and that transparency should, should stand out. Needless to say, I voted for number two. <laughs> <laughs> so we need some transparency on the stage then. <laughs> What's my... This might reflect the issue of trust that we were talking exactly. about, right? Yep. Because at the end of the day, I think what the audience is saying is we don't trust these companies to do it on their own, which right. again, I think it, it's, exactly. if the dynamic is that this can be investor driven, if it can be in the self-interest of a company, 
because it'll attract more capital, because it will be more successful, because it will have a better profile, that's why I want to disclose, then you, you don't need this, right? right. So uh, That also, yeah, if I may just to add, sure, that sure. also uh, benefits the company itself. Uh, even within the company, right. you create accountability. Think about only on the company part. If you put people, different division in the company, accountable for their performance, the company will succeed. So if all companies really believe in, in disclosure and believe in accountability, you'll be accountable for what you do. Mm -hmm. And that will save the assets and save uh, and, and ensure sustainability as well. Definitely. So on that positive note, we, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. And if I can invite uh, questions from the audience. Oh, we have one in the back. Hooray. And a second one on this side. I am Dr. Rizvi, the American University of Sharjah. I teach family business. Before that, I did research at the University of Cambridge from where I hold the PhD, and that was on trust. And it was trust in ethnic business networks in UK. My question to you, during my research, both at Cambridge, and here I find I'm doing research here too in the UAE and at the American University, there is a link of trust with culture in solidarity of the society. I'll give you an example. ISO 9000. Lots of people would not like to have it because it allows a third party inspection. They don't trust someone from outside to look at the business. How do you expect they will make things transparent? It's, again, I think my view is it's driven by need. So if, there, if this company has customers that expect it to be ISO compliant and certified, they have to do it, right? So, I mean. No, my point is education. Uh -huh. Unless you educate them, they will always have this apprehension. You cannot, education overcomes this kind of apprehension and bias. So one of the aims should be, as this forum is very ably doing, is to educate the industry in an outreach program in which like Curl Initiative should reach every boardroom of the UAE. That's one way. Mm. I guess maybe, I, maybe I'm a bit more cynical. I, I guess I, I tend to think that just educating doesn't necessarily get people as motivated than their self-interest. And I think you can, you can do outreach, you can do that and make, make the tools available. I think they're great once somebody has realized why this is good for me, why this is good for my company. Um, then they will reach out and get that education. I, that's my, my personal uh, But again, on. bring, back, uh, my, bring you, my, you back to my, my initial statement which I said, there's a cultural problem. People and the society here are insular. They want to live within themselves. Okay, as opposed to in the West, where because of the knowledge, education, and a lot of transitional experience of hundreds of years of transition, that thing is not available here. It's just the society is beginning to, to evolve in the same way as in the West. I'm talking about the businesses, right? So this insularity has to be overcome. Yeah. I think it's a journey, if I may yeah. just. It's a journey that it's taking place. Mm -hmm. Corporate social responsibility 15 years ago was a term was not known, known to this region. We look at charity as a, as a corporate social responsibility. And, and we started to develop the, these thoughts, the business sector I'm talking about. And we realized that corporate social responsibility is not giving charity. It's more than that. It is one way to link society with the business. And at the end, society and the business benefits. Again, it's a journey. And it is an educational process, directly and indirectly, is taking place. And as Zulfi has mentioned, there is a need. So the business sector sometimes is driven by needs, by opportunities. And we feel there is an opportunity to get close to our society. There is an opportunity to train our employees. There is an opportunity to tap to the untapped resources, which is the female sector. So there's a lot of things is driven by needs. And it's, don't expect it to take a place in, in an overnight. It will take time. 
hopefully thank not long time. Thank you. And Amir, do you have a, anything to add to that? I uh, hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little controversial on this. <laughs> no, please. That's, that's ISO 9000 uh, was done by activists, basically. Mm -hmm. I, it's a, there's a broad statement for you. I, nobody likes third parties to come in and look into your organizations. That's why if I'm a strong believer regulation is not the answer. Self-regulation, maybe, or guiding principles. Uh, culture of transparency and accountability. This region has actually been a lot faster in, for example, women's uh, rights to do business at one level. Uh, in the corporate world, some parts are successful with women leaders and some are not. But then what do we offer in the Western world? I grew up in the West where women were never seen as other than housewives or head of household, period. Working in, in a workplace, 30% discount rate is the salary, and it still exists, and greater than it. Thank you. Definitely, and, and I wanted to add one thing that, that I think it shows a combination of the two, uh, education versus kind of this uh, cultural change. The last time I was in Dubai, I attended a Pearl Initiative event, um, and I ran into one of uh, our World Economic Forum members who had worked for a company, or who was still working for a company that had uh, been affected by uh, a corruption case. And I have to tell you that he was so enthusiastic about the changes that they had made, and he was such a good uh, supporter of compliance, transparency, that he was educating his peers on his experiences and, and how that had worked. So um, when you take that cultural uh, piece, and then, then uh, someone who's lived the trial by fire, uh, and, and that person is doing the education, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of power behind that. So that was, that's just my Thank you. The piece I, I thought I'd add. And we have one more question, we have time, one more question, and it's in the back. Sure, thank oh. you. Um, Tofik Rahim, Executive Director at, at Globesite. Um, I just want to, it might seem like a pivot, and I was trying to see where to situate this in the schedule, but it's really building on uh, the comment and question from the last, uh, I guess, from the audience, and that's about insularity. And I wanted to understand from your perspective as corporate leaders, uh, this idea of insularity, even in, within this room right now, where we can kind of get to in the Gulf, in the UAE, and especially Dubai. And how do you think about, as corporates, as yourself, as corporate citizens, the wider community of the Middle East and North Africa? You know, we're talking about some great issues. I think the last panel on uh, women in the workplace was great. But really, we're in a region in tremendous turmoil, destruction, failed states. You know, we're talking about women. Look at what's happening with Daesh in Iraq. These are real issues, and these are part of the wider community that we are all in, whether we like to see it or not. So where do you see corporates, where do you see companies, where do you see this sector within that wider community, and what's the obligation, what's the integrity in relating to that wider community? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to take the first? Khaled <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're, not, we're not doing enough. That's a simple answer to your question. We're not doing enough. But um, there are things that we can do under our capacity as a private sector. And there are things that the government has to do. Um, in our capacity, in our business, we look to our people, our employees, are the most important assets. And we, spend, we spare no efforts to, uh, uh, to develop them. But also, uh, we're trying to create a redundancy within our structure to attract more candidates. Not to employ them, to train them. And to disseminate the right information, the right work ethics, the right knowledge to them. They may continue with us, and they may leave us. And that's fine. That adds value to the society. We sponsor a lot of programs. 
and there are a lot of programs being done, being done by non-profit organizations which we sponsor. Their targets is to educate the youngsters, male and female. That contribute. Are we doing enough? No. There is a lot of things that we have to do in uplifting the level of knowledge, the work mm -hmm. ethics, the style of thinking, uh, the importance of time, the importance of resources. There is a lot of things that we have to work on it, along with a non-profitable organization, along with the government sector. It's a, uh, it's a journey that just started, and hopefully the crisis that's surrounding us will create an opportunity for us and for the society to learn from. I think, um, I think that we've, we've gotten a lot of things out of this panel today. Uh, we've heard that, that doing things collectively is, a, is an important way to do things and that maybe regulation isn't always the way. Uh, that embedding a, a culture of uh, integrity and transparency is probably one of the strongest things that a company can do for its growth and, and profitability. And, um, and that, that transparency uh, can increase uh, investment within the region and, uh, and hopefully regional growth. So I thank the panel for being here, and I thank you for your, for your attention, and uh, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you.